Hi everyone, we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it and hope that you enjoy this session of our Return and Learn series. Um, I want to introduce our presenter for tonight. This is Randy Halfling. He's our General Services Manager here at Moravian um, and knows a wealth of knowledge about all of the landscape. So he's going to share a little bit about some of the history of the landscape and different things like that. So if we can give Randy a little bit of a round of applause. For and feel free to get up for a snack if you need to. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Um, I've been in Marine for 10 years, almost 10 years, and you know, besides my responsibilities of taking grounds, I really enjoy talking about the campus that I've fallen in love with. You as alum, people who work, work here, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir. So, to was asked back in October last year to do this, and so hopefully you'll enjoy it, but I really look forward to tonight. So, um, we'll get started. Um, so I want to do something to kind of draw people into it. How well do you know your campus? Um, you as alum, you know, you certainly, you came here, you, you know the campus. But I want to try and show you from a different perspective, the campus landscape. Um, before I go there, I, about myself. Um, so I, a couple degrees that I hold. Um, also, I have a background in historic preservation. So, when I came to interview for Moravian College, um, walking around the campus um, with my wife and seeing the buildings on campus was like, this is a dream come true. You know, knowing the landscaping and then working around beautiful buildings, you know, it's, it's a marriage made in heaven. So, um, my background in, in landscaping. Um, different sorts with working for small companies as well as uh, large national companies. Um, this gave me quite a different experiences and everything which I think prepared me for coming here because you know working a college campus every day is you know a new adventure. Um, and then one nice perk is I have two daughters here attending, future Greyhounds. So not often you have a job where walking to campus so all of a sudden one of my daughters will bump me and say, hey dad, you know, so they're not, fortunately they don't shy away from me. So it's, it's nice. Gets my wife a little jealous if I say, you know, we went out to lunch together, you know, my daughter and I, but hey, I'm enjoying every minute of it. So, you guys, again, you know Moravian College, North Campus. Um, for men's college, South Campus, Heard Campus, you guys know that. We know we're the sixth oldest college in the country. I brag every chance I can with other people. Most of them don't know Moravian College, but they will, and I say we're the sixth oldest, and it usually <coughs> draws them in and gets them more interested. This is a picture from Raving Archives. Hard to tell, you know, in detail, but this is the start where I want to talk about our campus. Um, how many of you know when Bethlehem was settled and the uh, South Campus was really the heart of Bethlehem uh, then? Uh, but there was gardens in those camp in that area down there, uh, both formal as well as productive with vegetables. And, and such, and herbs. They grew plants for medicine. Much better picture showing it. And if you look right in here, there's actually, this is a stone wall separating the gardens. There it is. In the background is Widow's House. <laughs> so this is the path walking over to what would be the back of the Hill dorm on South Campus. So it's still there, which you know is great that that was kept. Um, so you can actually tangibly touch something from our past. Um, As 
I started working here and finding out some of these things about Moravian and the, the landscape, I went over to the Moravian archives, met a gentleman over there, archivist Tom McCullough. He had an interest in horticulture. So he started doing some digging into what they have over there and came across where a professor uh, from Copenhagen back in the mid 1700s had uh, reached out to the Moravians as they were traveling back and forth from here to Europe, asking them if they could bring back to Europe plant material for him. He was a botanist and he was teaching botany in Copenhagen. He wanted to show those specimens in his class. So what you're seeing here is uh, one of the pages of it. It's, you know, Moravians, it was German. Fortunately, when he wrote this, it's in Latin, it's botanical names of the plants. So knowing Latin and botanical names, I was at least able to decipher what these were. And it goes from your common flowers to legumes to different grains. Uh, like I said, over 300 different plants that he wanted brought back. So kind of an aspect that you wouldn't expect from Moravian College, you know, or our campus that that was going on. And you got to think about the world at that time. Not as many people in the world, so it was kind of easier in that world with horticulture and botany to know each other. Um, so um, I was kind of surprised for it. Now with the archives, they used to people inquiring about property, people, uh, places that never occurred to them to think about plant material. So now for the last six, seven, eight years, Tom and others are starting to look for that because honestly they don't know what all they have over there. They've slowly just, you know, um, documented the information they have. But now he's come across where students at Moravian College and Women's School had uh, pressed herbs from the 1800s. And they were still there. He found it, opened up, and they were pressed into the, into the book. So it was like, this is great. You know, the, the, there's that kind of, for horticulturists to have that kind of history. Because again, when you think about Moravian or schools, how many colleges have archives as old as ours? You know, going back to Europe to the 1500s. So we have that resource right here. And it's always interesting when he sends me something new that he found. Um, so I got to make sure my script here. Um, and the previous picture of, um, was showing the wall. That was engraving uh, watercolor pen on paper. Um, and the, the date that it was actually originally drawn was on the birthday of Anna Nitchman. If you know Anna Nitchman's connection to Raven College. Um, particularly with Benigna uh, when the college was started. <coughs> John Bartram. Anybody know Bartram's Gardens down up in uh, Philadelphia? Okay. So John Bartram, for those of you who don't know who he is or was, um, world renowned but not botanist. Uh, he traveled up and down the East Coast, United States, collecting plant material, sending it back to England. Uh, the King of England uh, paid for these plants to be sent back. Um, doing research, and one of our professors, who's now passed, Frank Cusser, he and I got together and we started to come across research that we believe that the Bartrams, both he and his son uh, were communicating with the Moravians as he traveled through here to upstate New York. So again, thinking about the Moravians bringing plant material back and forth from here to Europe, <coughs> he may have been trading plant material with the Moravians as well on our campus. And also why I'm telling you this is thinking about those gardens on South Campus, the specimen gardens there, plants were being putting in those gardens from these people that were coming through here like Bartram. So Bartram, story goes, is um, he was down in uh, Georgia 
in the mid-1700s mid with his son, uh, and he came along this river, the Altamaha River, and he found these trees growing about the size of a dogwood, beautiful blooms growing everywhere. So they collected some samples and they brought it back to uh, Philadelphia. And he was very good friends with that gentleman. Who was that? Adventure Frank. Very good friends. And he named one of the, this tree that they found after him, Ben Franklin tree. Um, and that's what it looks like. <coughs> So it gets the flowers later in the year and in the fall color. When I heard about this when I was in college, about this tree, uh, I was just fascinated since then, is they went back a few years later to collect some more samples and they were gone. Disappeared. And again, keep in mind, they were just growing just wild along this, the Altamaha River. They've never been found again in a while. So those specimens that they brought back to Philadelphia, they did cuttings and root them out, they're all descendants of the trees that they found. We have one on South Campus, Cool Dining Hall. So that's an Arbor Day tree we planted, um, I think it was 2010 maybe, because uh, I had to have one on campus. It was not easy to find either. Um, and when we were doing the celebration, Frank Hersick said to me, you know, Benjamin Franklin was on our campus. You know, he was talking with the Moravians about using Brethren House for a hospital during the Revolutionary War. He may have walked right by or right on top of where this tree is planted. So maybe sound a little quirky, but to me it's like, how many colleges can say that? You know, I'm going to say it. We have a tree. We have a tree named after him. It's on our campus. He was on our campus. You know, hey, I'm going to brag. Get people to uh, be again drawn to Moravian. Um, anybody recognize that name? Schweinitz. Great grandson of. Uh, Zinzendorf, again, well-known name on campus. Again, talking with Frank, uh, early on in, when he was starting his career here at the college, he did a lot of research on the Schweinitz, come to find out. Also, I think he was uh, more so with John Bartram's son with trading plant material. In fact, Frank shared with me a folder that was probably two inches thick of the research he did on it. Uh, and we talked about doing even more research. So it was unfortunately he passed, but again, just horticulturally, just these connections with the Moravian, just uh, really great. Um, so now, looking here, this is South Campus. Um, the story that was shared back in 1981 it was called the second monday round table and this is how it goes campus trees the seminary souvenir is describing conditions at the time of 1815 moved to the brethren's house stated that the land to the south was covered only with grass and below was the meadow with only sycamores lying the creek trees and shrubbery were planted walks laid out and other means taken to beautify the spot. In 1854, the same source records that the greensward was planted anew with shade trees and evergreens. This plot, thus beautified, has been incorporated with pleasure grounds below and together provide a delightful retreat. So, Central Moravian Church, you can see this is the top of Brethren. And this is where the street used to go through, cutting across the creek um, up to Main Street. And my little bit of artistic license, what was there, but even if it's close, it really uh, presents a nice, uh, pleasant space. Um, same area. 
more recent, obviously. This is looking up the hill just beyond is Widow's House. What you're seeing in the foreground here is Star Bethlehem. It's a uh, bulb that comes up. It's actually come up the green part of it and it'll be blooming in the next three weeks. We let it go and it spreads. I mean, there's probably uh, almost an acre of it down there. So if you get down to South Campus in, in about, like I said, a month, you'll see this blooming. In the background, you see some tulips just peeking up. That was uh, something I did with alumni. Um, I think it was around 2010, 2011. We had alum come out with our students and plant those bulbs just to kind of get that connection between our current students and alum. Um, so those tulips keep coming up and it was great young and old there to do that. Um, so we're kind of moving forward to the same spaces just to kind of share as we're going along things you again might not know about Moravian. On the left is the back of Main Hall, the women's dorm, and the steps going up. That is the uh, Ruth Constantine Memorial Garden. It was put in 2010. She was a student of the Women's College. Uh, she had passed, but her family wanted to put a memorial garden in for her, um, so that was planted in there. And then in 2012, uh, one of our police officers who's still working here, his daughter, uh, Allison Nicole Perno, uh, she was 12 years old, passed away suddenly, and he wanted to do something to uh, remember her because he said when she was going to come here as a student eventually, she would probably be staying in that dorm. In fact, he's the officer that stays down on South, South Campus, and the students are really, there's a, quite a bond between them. So we've added plants, and he does a memorial every year of service down there around her birthday so he'll give money to put more plants in and um, we always try and make it look as best as possible for that to uh, memorialize her. Um, in the middle picture and, and over to the right, if, again the hill dorm if you know where it is, um, there's a steep slope that goes down to the back of it. Um, I'm working with some faculty in the science department we wanted to transform the landscape into something more sustainable. So again, students and my staff and, and faculty working together, on the right you're seeing where we're planting native plants in there uh, for the landscape. And what that is is so the water flows through there and it goes in a catch basin and eventually goes out to the Monocacy Creek. This will help purify the water. Uh, but it's also, more importantly, is this is a research space for our students because it had been before this, students are traveling 20 or 30 miles to go do this research. They're actually doing it on your campus here. Um, so they can walk right outside their dorm and do it. And we've added some more plants along the time, and of course people are welcome to walk down there. In fact, they put a weather station down there to monitor the flow and everything like that. <coughs> so it's an outdoor lab. And then two years ago, we, on the steep slope, put a meadow in wildflower meadow so and this spring there's going to be beehives going in to uh, give the and obviously full circle of pollinating so again some neat things going on, on our campus <coughs> here are some comments from Robert Snyder so again one of the pleasures of working here is um, I think it was almost the first couple months I was here, Maggie Snyder, mm -hmm. his daughter, reached out to me. Her mother was still alive, living in Widow's house. Uh, wanted to talk about some of the trees that Father planted on campus. Um, so Bob was assistant to President Reverend Dr. Raymond Halpert from 1946 until his retirement in 1984. Long time. Um, I wish I could have met him. I said this a couple of times to Maggie. Um, his love for the campus and the trees, and um, I think hopefully we would have, uh, I would like to think we would have talked for hours about our campus. Um, but one of the things that he started doing 
was as each child was born, he'd have a tree planted. So, um, what's the point of this time? Right back here, right behind Memorial Hall, and over here, forget which tree it is, but one of them is when Maggie was born. So, and that's her sister over there. And then as other trees are planted, other siblings, the crabapples along the side of Comenius and actually over Memorial Hall are grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So, um, pretty special. Um, I think you guys recognize this building. Um, yeah, this is from a, a portrait that's over in uh, P.P. Hack. Campus looks a little different there. Right there's Johnson Hall. Uh, dorm Circle. It's not there. Anybody Otis remember Place. Otis Place? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I heard some real interesting stories about that place. Yeah. Um, so, I'm going to share another little uh, story that was shared. Um, Built in 1892, Camise Hall housed dorms, classrooms, offices, cafeteria, and gym. Still haven't figured out where the cafeteria and gym were. The library used to be in there, too. Was that? At one time, the library was in there. Yeah, the library, there, because it's actually over the doorway out front, it says library. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> um, driveway was still, this side was in when I moved in. Um, but this is obviously now start to look at the trees. Yeah. <laughs> that actually that is probably this tree here. Mm -hmm. Can't see it over on this side, but these here. Mm -hmm. oh, I love looking at the old pictures and just if they're still the existing trees the comparison. Thank you to Ed Yakel. He shared with me when he was found out we were doing this, this talk, these pictures that relative to his hat. So, um, <clears throat> on the night, Halloween night, 1930, a fire gutted the top three floors. In 1914, it was rebuilt to become what we know today. So Ed, Ed and I were talking earlier this evening that this almost looks like the day after. Yeah. You see the furniture, everybody's congregated out here. I mean, to see this, it looks like it's still smoldering. The building's been through quite a bit. Thank God they rebuilt it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so also, um, some of our best known trees on campus are the copper beaches planted in front of um, in front of Camus Hall under the back of them so you can see them again. So over here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. They were planted by J. Taylor Hamilton in front of Camus in 1820. Um, the late Bishop Kenneth Hamilton recalled how his father, a bishop before him and president of college and seminary from 1819 to 18 or 1928, often spoke of being ridiculed for planting the beaches so far apart in front of the new building. Well, I don't think we can ridicule him now for that. Um, and then, unfortunately, we did lose this one uh, back in early 1990s, so it was replanted. Actually, it's struggling again, and it's probably gonna come down, and we're gonna plant a new one in its place to uh, add girdling roots. So it's not disease-oriented, it just, from the nursery, it didn't grow properly. Just so we can keep that, because that's a trademark of Comedius Hall to see that there. Um, but again, 1820. So, 
over here, um, Colonial Hall. Mm -hmm. So this is Locust Street out here. And we're coming up to be the front of Colonial Hall. Two sorority houses on the corner of uh, Locust and Main Street. Mm -hmm. Colonial Hall and Archives, now the admission building, were built in 1929 and 1930. For some reason, no trees were planted except for the Norway maples in the narrow band between the sidewalk and street. In the late 1940s, Paul Cunningham, superintendent of buildings and grounds, planted four red oaks about the thickness of your thumb on the building side of the walks along Main Street. So, out here. 1940s size of your thumb. Oh, I'd say they grow up pretty well. Yeah. Um, he then points out the fact that the oak at the corner of Maine Elizabeth is larger than the other ones because it was planted in good soil and no compaction from other trees. Um, that's actually here, sorry, it was cut off, but definitely prominent on that corner there. It's done very well. Uh, the new residence halls have seen the planting of tulip trees, willow oaks, basswood, and European plane trees. And now they're talking about down in here. Um, which, <coughs> how many of you know that Rao Hassler dorm over here was built in 1958? So it's just one of our, other than Comedia, one of our oldest dorms on, on main campus. <coughs> the honey locusts planted in Quad, 1954. Mm -hmm. So there's honey locusts more in that picture I showed you with um, showing um, Bob Snyder's picture. Um, so you're looking down through here. If you, I'm sure you know where the 1742 marker is. Mm -hmm. And right along here you see the sycamores. This used to be Monocacy Street. These were the street trees. Which I've done some tours on campus and people that have walked the campus many times are like never even occurred to them to look down the street and see that going through that LA. Um, so one of the things with Bob Snyder was when he retired in 1984, Margaret recalls and he, he, returned, he earned his honorary degree from the college, he said, it has been a privilege watching trees and students grow. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, to have spent time with him would have been great. Um, over here, these trees were going down Locust Street, right by the Hall of Science. Mm -hmm. These are linden trees. So I don't know how many know Moravian Church Lindens are very precious to the Raven. They go all the way back to its earliest times. So we have quite a few lindens on our campus. Um, so again, if you're walking through and you see those trees, there is a connection to beyond just you know the normal. These are definitely important parts of Moravian College. So one of the fun things I could do. Um, in 2013 was starting a tree inventory. Um, thinking about, for us, for managing the trees, it's a great tool. We get the trees inventory, we know we have the conditions of them. We want to take it a step further. We want to get our students engaged with it. So, I mean, there's a the connection with classes and friends, but now to connection with the actual physical, with the, with the, the landscaping. So this was the first year um, with our students out there. They actually, the inventory, there was 500 trees inventory on campus. And there's a tag. So what I'm sharing with you is you're walking through campus, um, look for these blue tags. Um, they're each numbered. If you go on the college's campus maps, you'll actually pull, pull up the tree inventory site. And each number corresponds to those trees. You can click on it, it gives you the information about the tree. Um, we've been doing this every year since. We've been six years now with the students. They'll go out, 
with uh, Professor and um, Bartlett Tree experts, and their staff. So they'll have a lecture time in the class where Bartlett will share what they do as far as inventorying the trees, which by the way, Bartlett, um, they maintain the trees at Buckingham Palace. They maintain the trees at the 9-11 Memorial. So that's why we have them here. Is, I mean, to take care of those trees, we want them here. Um, but then when they go out in the lab for about three hours, they're working with the students um, with our trees. On the left is an instrument called a resistograph. It's pretty cool. It basically, you put up the tree and it sends, like a, it's like a, a sonogram. It'll go into the tree and just tell you, and it prints, prints out whether it's hollow or not without actually digging into the tree. It's pretty expensive and they don't always have it available, but they've always had it available for our students. And one of the neat things is every year we'll ask at the end of the uh, lab, do you think we should do this again? And every year it's been a resounding. Fortunately, the students say, let's, yeah, do it again. So we know the students are enjoying it um, and they want to be um, uh, part of this. And in fact, they'll approach me about working with my staff on the ground. So we're finding that connection. Um, to date, we have um, almost 800 trees inventory. One of the nice things about the inventory is it give us approximate value of the trees um, for insurance purposes and to justify the money that's spent for maintaining them. Roughly eight and a half million dollars in value. <laughs> so I don't have anywhere near that budget, but, um, but still. And also the inventory is on the city website. So thinking somebody wants to come to Bethlehem to tour it for historic aspect, they go into that inventory. Now hopefully they come to Raven College and see what it's all about. So some of the reports um, just on the left is showing the variety of species of trees, the most dominant. And then on the right is showing uh, the size of the trees. The bottom is showing the age of the trees, and that's just a snippet of the map that would come up for you. And it has at the top the eight and a half million dollars. Um, so, what I tell people in these talks is, you see the variety, and it's and it's kind of spread across, which is good. It's not too heavy. Although you see on this side the tree diameter. We have is we have a good variety of healthy trees. Not all healthy completely. We have a good mix of age. And in fact, hearing from Bartlett, who works all over the country and stuff, they say we've, we've got a good collection of trees here, which of course I like to hear that since I'm responsible <coughs> for it and my staff for maintaining them. Um, so it's not too many old trees where they're going to start failing or too many young trees that just look stark here. So the other thing, getting back to the Moravian <coughs> Settlement and the gardens is, on South Campus is a tree, um, it's a Scotch Elm. Um, if you go between Brethren Main Hall and look south, directly in front of you will be the elm tree. Um, we had Bartlett measure it, and there's specific measurements that need to be taken, and there's points given and submitted to, the, to review. And every state has a champion tree list. What it means is the top 10 trees of each species for the state. Um, who are the biggest, have the largest known in, in the state. And in fact, the largest known in the country. So we have a national champion. Um, and also, a plaque that will be going up, hopefully this spring, is it's a bicentennial tree. So it goes back to our bicentennial. We were debating whether to drill safely and see about how old it is, but we're thinking about 200 plus years now. So it's very old. Its value alone is, um, I think that one's $68,000. So quite expensive to have to replace that. Um, There's a newspaper article when that came out.
the valuation, how do they calculate? What is the cal calculated off? They use the nursery association uh, calibration that's the standard for the association. Um, it's not exact, so insurance company might debate it, but it's the standard it's used across the cost because you can't right, replace right. it. It's saying that's what the replacement cost be, but we wouldn't obviously, or nobody could replace it in kind. But it's again just to justify the, the purpose, and this is what I'm going to go into next, is preserving it. So we're seeing these pictures here is the bucket truck over there. We had lightning tr protection put in. So most people, you know, light protection for buildings. <coughs> Well, this tree stands out among all of them on South Campus. Um, so we wanted to protect it. And two rods, copper rods, were put out all the way to the top of the tree. They used a buck bucket truck that day to do some pruning on it, but they actually climbed the tree. Um, so somebody scaled it all the way up there. I saw him, he took a rope to swing it all the way up to the top and then tied it on and climbed the tree. Um, what you're seeing on the right is a spool of copper that comes down. So this runs down the, the bottom of the base of the tree and it runs out to where the, the edge of the canopy is and there's a 10 foot copper rod that goes into the ground mm -hmm. to ground it. Um, so there's two rods up at the top and a lot of science goes into determining this and um, in fact what you're seeing down there, the gentleman here is from the company. Pick this company and do it because that gentleman worked at Monticello and the University of Virginia. Um, so he worked with some special trees and I think Moravian was worth having someone like that here. What he's doing is he's talking to the physics club. Um, he's being obviously science, you know, with the lightning protection and he, we shared some uh, papers on how this is determined, because there's a science behind it, obviously, and the technology has changed over time. So he's explaining to the students the process of installing it and how it's done, um, especially with going out to the drip line and everything like that. Um, so again, getting our students engaged. It's not this stuff going on in our department and people not knowing about it. We want people to know what we're doing out here. Um, so. In fact, what we also have is on the back of the tree, there's a fuse on the copper wire. And that's why a fuse. Well, if it's doing its job, you're never going to know if it got struck by lightning. Right? It's alive. It's, we put a fuse there so that if it does get struck by lightning, the fuse will blow. And we'll put a new fuse on. So when I took this job, I thought about, well, just to humble myself, is the college has been around for 276 years. It's been somebody since day one taking care of the grounds, you know, herding the sheep around or whatever. So I'm in a long line until now, and there's hopefully be a long line after me. So I'm hoping over time, somebody will document how many times a fuse is blown. And I tell people, you know, 30 years from now, and it got blown three times, and they see the tree there healthy and alive, and like, Oh. It's kind of neat, you know, so it's just a little bit at, more to add to it. Other thing about the tree inventory that a little different that kind of caught even Bartlett off guard is, is we have memorial trees on campus. And wanted to get students engaged somehow that normally wouldn't be. So we reached out to the English department. <coughs> This young lady here was an English major. The lady here, her husband planted this tree in honor of Priscilla Payne. Well, we had our student interview her about the gentleman that had the tree planted. There's also a tree in his memory, Larry Myers. He had numerous tr trees planted. Well, if you go to particular trees on our campus, they'll say Memorial Tree. Um, there'll be a story that pops up, her article that she wrote about Larry. So what I'm telling you this is, is because we plant trees, and a lot of people do that in Memorial someone, so it's a tree. We take it, take it a step further. We want to have it about the person. 
because this inventory is internet based. So somebody in California that wants to see a tree that was planted for a relative, they also can read about the relative. So this is a living document for, for hopefully eternity. But getting the students again involved with our alum and everything, and then download this picture into there, it just continues that's the history of Moravian College. So we also do our work on campus. This is a tree on South Campus. This is Payne Gallery. You see where it's rotting, so we had it taken down. We do our pruning here. We also, this is Comedius Hall in the South End. When we re-landscaped it, I asked for the tree that we moved out further so it would grow better. So yeah, not often you see a tree spade, but we have used them on campus um, to move them around. We also have had a couple times, yeah, you guys, um, we've had contractors here, other tree services, to learn different procedures and stuff. And this is where he's injecting our trees for emerald ash borer. So we do invite people on campus to see our beautiful trees on campus, and they get an educational component out of it. They use our classrooms for the lecture part and go out. So this is kind of goings on you would maybe know about. Spotter lanterfly. Well, let me tell you, I've gotten plenty of emails from professors and students about seeing them on our campus. And we do have them. Uh, unfortunately, right where the elm is on South Campus, we have its favorite tree that it loves. It happens to be a weed tree, Tree of Heaven, mm -hmm. which you're supposed to kill. But ours is the third largest in the state. So actually, it's a protected tree, and it's part of those original gardens that were planted by Moravians. Um, in fact, with the elm and that tree there, you can see the layout. It, it's in a pattern. So we know that that was purposely planted there for the original gardens. Best part of my job, other than tonight. These are students from Moravian Academy. So they learn about the Moravian settlement and history. And having some dialogue with one of their uh, science teachers, talked about getting them on our campus to see it. Not only just about the buildings, but the landscape. So we've been doing this for four years. Um, it's gotten to now about 100 students that'll come out. So I'll spend a day, like three or four sessions with them coming out. And they'll study the inventory ahead of time. They didn't do that the first year because they didn't know about it. But now they study and they study the elm, which is right here. And I love it because I have them on Church Street right by our brother hold them back and I'll say, okay, let's turn the corner. And they go in between those buildings, they see it. And one year the students were like, oh, there it is. <laughs> they were like, learning about it, hearing about it, and now they actually get to see it. So um, the, what they're doing is the lantern fly happen to be on it. So they're very inquisitive with it. Um, it was just fun to do that. Every year we get their group picture, I send it to the teacher. Um, it just seems to keep growing. So, again, people coming to our campus, seeing it, young people, hopefully some of these students, these young people will become students of Raven College, fellow alums. So, yeah, it's just one of the perks of the job to be able to do this. So the other thing is, because of the inventory and how well we take care of our trees, is, um, we're a tree campus USA. So you know the city of Bethlehem is a tree city USA. I think 25 years now. Well, we applied for become a tree campus USA and we got it. Now we're just, we just third year of accreditation. And it's involved to apply for it. Uh, we actually have a committee that has to meet and, and uh, talk about protecting our trees and we have to have a plan. Um, but part of that is we have to celebrate Arbor Day. Um, so this is the planting that was done uh, last year on South Campus. Here's Frank. Um, we get a good group of people coming out. Actually, it was two years. This was last year. This is by the hub. Um, and the tree that was planted was the witch hazel, which happens to be in bloom right now with yellow blooms. Um, it was an honor of Frank. 
Um, we've also seen throughout campus, you see these little banners on the lampposts identifying as the Tree Campus USA. So, pretty special to have that um, designation. So this is my staff, a couple students that helped me make this happen. And I just like this picture of the sunset, you know, just looking to the future, um, right at college. And again, I want to thank Tom and Maggie Snyder and Ed for their uh, helping me get this together. So that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you. Now, any questions you might have? Are you worried about the impact of the lantern fly on our trees? Or? Well, we did have the tree having <coughs> treated both two ways. We had it treated on the bark to kill the ones that are there, and then we actually had systemically treated through the tree. So systemic means it's injected into it goes through the whole tree and that's the other thing that we've transitioned to in the time i've been here is not over spraying which they used to do so it's as much as we can injection and with ash borer we inject them and it's it lasts for two years in fact when we put up the health science building we have ash trees along main street and we wanted to continue that down the in front of the health science building and the city was really didn't want us to do it in fact said no negotiated with them and said, hey, we are treating them. And again, it's part of a relationship with the city forester. You know, we have to foster that. And we do have a good relationship. So we're treating them. Treat this as a pilot program. As long as we're treating them, maybe the emerald ash will peak and then it'll eventually move on and we'll have our trees because we want to keep that look along the campus. So again, we, I wish I had more money to do more for the for protecting the trees, but so far, you know, we get a few branches that come down and twigs, but our trees are, are doing well. What is your budget for maintaining the uh, trees? Uh, probably shouldn't be saying, but I'll tell you it's, it's around 20000 Does that come out of the general budget? Yeah, in my grounds budget, yeah. And, um, it gets enough, we have to continually, you know, prune the trees away from the buildings. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest, I get teased a lot about how many trees we have on campus and the gutters getting clogged and everything. And people say we need to have less trees and <coughs> oh, they know I don't want to hear that. Because I, I mean, I'm biased. But again, could you imagine Raven College without even half the trees, mm -hmm. how different it look? Again, you look at our buildings and you look at those trees mature, it's, it's, meant to be. I mean, it's uh, perfect harmony there. Um, to walk through there in the shade. So, so if somebody wants to plant a tree, so we just had a class of 68 at their 50th reunion and they wanted to have a tree and a marker dedication for their class. So we talked to Randy and what we found was a tree that was an orphan tree. And they decided to take that into their, their class and that became their tree and they put a marker on it and they, they made a donation to the college for the ability to do that. And then eventually we'll put it into the tree inventory again for posterity for people who know that you know they were part of you know the campus. So any other questions? How expensive is it to a donor to donate a, a memorial tree? I think it's around, it's either three or four hundred dollars. Um, I don't know if that includes the plaque. Um, I don't think it does, but it depends on how big a plaque you want to get. So we were fortunate with the tree that that class selected because it was in place. Mm -hmm. It was planted. If you're talking yeah. about doing a new tree and the planting, it's, it's a little bit different kind of labor intense as opposed to just finding an orphan tree mm -hmm. that you want to bring into your home. <laughs> So with the Arbor Day trees, we try and encourage people who want to put native trees in. Um, in fact, we're also putting in trees because some of my peers at other colleges, <coughs> unfortunately with climate change, are starting to put in some more southern trees. Um, just anticipating as the climate starts to get warmer, we want to have trees that will survive. So I've started to do that where I can. I can tell you, it's, 
kind of a uh, blessing and a curse at the same time. We have so many trees, they're so healthy, and when people do want to put new trees in, it's hard because I don't want them to keep compete with the existing ones. So it's it's growing harder and harder to find trees, or places for trees. Um, and we do Arbor Day every year, so there's a guarantee we're going to be putting a tree in. The other thing is, share this with is some schools are actually doing where there are people who are t taking ownership of existing trees. One school in particular in Ohio is, has an endowment for the trees. So it'd be nice someday to have the endowment that would help pay for it. And I know we have our facility budget to maintain them, but they actually have a separate endowment to help maintain their trees on campus. Um, so see maybe someday. Good thing is we have our trees. So we don't have to wait for that. You mentioned the Linden tree. Is that uh, a local uh, tree? And I know that Linden Street was named after the Linden, but is that a, a local? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, if you go through campus and you go to the back behind Bernhard Wilhelm, if you know where that is, uh, there's a very large one there. In fact, when you were putting in the hillside of apartments, professor at the time, Rocky, they were talking about taking that tree down. He said, no, we're not taking that tree down. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Is that Mr. He, Myers? Mm -hmm. Dr. Myers? No. Oh. Doc Rock. Oh, yeah. Oh. He wanted to make sure that tree stayed. So it's, it's a massive one back there. Um, again, South Campus, I'm a little biased towards South Campus just because of the, obviously the history and those specimens, but just the garden space down there. Um, to actually still have that there, except with the elm and the other trees there. It's our definite connection to the past. So. And again, we're always finding out more things. The elm, because the Moravians were so good about record keeping. Like I heard early on when I started here that when they built Brethren House, they actually have documented how I many nails went into the building. So, <laughs> so what I'm hoping is because they were that extent with their records that somewhere in the archives probably has documented when that tree was planted here and in fact maybe where it came from and by whom. So I always say that's like the birth certificate. When I'm talking with Raven Academy students and I kind of get the students and into it is saying, you know, it's, it's a birth certificate and now you're seeing this grandpa of a tree. So it's this full story right there. So I'm hoping someday they'll come across it or we'll come across it in there. I'm sure it's there. <laughs> so, who knows what else we'll find there. Um, so. We, um, the alumni house has been recently renovated and actually today, uh, or I should say this evening, tonight is the first event where we have everything in place. The window treatment went into that. <laughs> <laughs> so we were all excited and, and the plants were on the, the porch, uh, but this has really taken a number of months. And the, uh, the Return to Learn actually is a program that we started over a year ago. And we look for alumni that have expertise and knowledge or staff members that have expertise and knowledge and bring alumni back to, to, uh, to hear and to hear the presentations and grow their understanding of, of Moravian, Moravian culture and, and, uh, and the experts that we have. And we were so fortunate, uh, and we are fortunate to have Randy. There's no one that has as, as much pride and love for this campus as Randy. And it's really, it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to see him in action and all that he does. So uh, thank you for this, Randy. We really appreciate you being here. And on, on behalf of uh, Amanda Warner and Pat Hanna, uh, I want to remind you as alumni or friends of the college, this is your home. And you're welcome here at any time. And we're so happy that you are here tonight. <laughs> Uh, if you have any ideas or suggestions regarding future return and learn activities, let us know and um, we'll see if we can put that together. I have a testimonial for lunch and uh, return and learn. The one that was the Twitter and Snapchat. Oh, social media. Oh. Social media. Social media yes. I am now officially snapping with my children. <laughs> and you are so hip. I have created an Instagram for my business, which I've only done it a couple times, but um, I, I actually mentioned it to a few people who were just fascinated by the fact that Moravian would be so connected to our alumni that you would even think to do something like that. And they went to larger universities and they're not doing what you're doing. So I just wanted to give a testimonial that I like it. 
keep it up. <laughs> and ideas are welcome, and you're welcome at any time. This is your home. Thank you. Thank you, Mama. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 